The biggest nuclear weapons development and design facility in America is in Los Alamos in New Mexico. It is here that the atom bombs that were used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were developed. At around the same time that this facility was established, a lesser known government funded facility was set up in a place called Livermore in Southern California, very close to the University of California in Berkeley. It was started by a scientist named Ernest Lawrence. Lawrence's institute was meant to compete with Los Alamos, but instead of nuclear fission, which was used to make the bomb, this institute was to focus on nuclear fusion. After Lawrence died after the Second World War, his lab got named the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Last week, 60 years after Ernest Lawrence's death, scientists at his institute discovered what could be the most defining discovery of our times. U.S. government scientists reached a major breakthrough in nuclear fusion. Monday, December 5th, 2022, was an important day in science. Reaching ignition in a controlled fusion experiment is an achievement that has come after more than 60 years of global research, development, engineering, and experimentation. Now, what is the big deal about this experiment, you'd ask? If all the data is correct and it checks out, this would be for the very first time that the world has achieved ignition. That's a fusion reaction which propagates, meaning that it delivers energy output that is much more than what it took to start the process. So for example, if you took 10 watts of energy to start this reaction, then you could end up with 100 watts or maybe even 1000 watts of energy at the end of this process. But there's a caveat, these results need to be confirmed. And this is not the first time that scientists have raised a false hope that nuclear fusion has produced a major breakthrough. But nothing as big as what we have seen at Livermore last week has ever been recorded, which is why people in the scientific community in the United States and around the world are extremely excited about this prospect. So what did it take to get here? To produce just one trillionth second of new ignition, these scientists at Livermore had to get around 200 giant lasers in the building where they were doing this experiment. The size of these 200 lasers is so huge, the building itself is 10 stories high. It is as wide as three football fields put together. Now that kind of resource and those kinds of costs are not easy to procure on a daily basis and that too just to produce everyday usable electricity. These lasers focused on what is a tiny fuel pellet which is basically composed of rare hydrogen isotopes and again these hydrogen isotopes are not easy to manufacture in large quantities. The resulting reaction of these hydrogen isotopes generated about 20% more energy than it absorbed. But then again Here's a bit of a catch. This 20% is in absolute terms. Like I said, if they put in 100 watts, you would get 120 watts. But this extra 20% does not capture the energy that was wasted before reaching the target. Or it also doesn't take into account the considerable energy investment in the building that is operating this mega uh, plethora of lasers. So right now, it is just starters. We are a long way away from reasonably using hydrogen fusion to be able to generate cheap electricity. But one good thing is that this will have no safety concerns, unlike nuclear power plants. According to the International Atomic Energy Agency, there have been over a hundred small and big nuclear accidents and incidents in the last 70, 75 years, including of course, grave ones like the ones in Chernobyl or Fukushima. Scientists have been chasing this dream of producing energy from nuclear fusion since the 1950s. So much so, there is now a running joke which says that fusion is the energy of the future and it will always be so. For now, the basic contention remains that fusion reaction will have to generate hundreds of thousands of times more energy than what it started with if it has to become an economical source of producing electricity. And then, of course, there are tens of hundreds of hurdles to cross if the world were to ever get there, if at all we do. This could possibly be the most complicated engineering project that humanity has ever undertaken. 
So it is probably premature for anyone to start calling in the cheerleaders, hailing this as the arrival of clean and green energy for everyone. Also, the cost of sharing this technology from developed countries to developing will be huge. And from whatever we're seeing in the climate change realm, advanced countries are highly reluctant to transfer such sophisticated technology that will help harness fusion energy to smaller, poorer countries in the global south. There is also, beyond the realm of nuclear fusion, beyond the realm of advanced scientifics, there is also a biology meets cosmic science argument in this as well. Now, if you remember, most of the atoms in your body, they were forged in the core of an ancient sun. There were first lighter elements, they fused into one another, and eventually they became heavier elements. That's how you have electrons and neutrons and protons and so on. So it can be argued that human beings are the survivors of asteroids and stars and supernovas. Humankind may finally have the answer to that question as to how the universe began, how life came to sustain on some celestial objects and not on some others. What was the origin of life itself and its connection with the cosmos? There will be a marked shift from the product, which is what we've seen over the last 20, 30, 40 years, to the producer, which is going to have enormous consequences that go far beyond just being able to make cheap electricity. In fact, the most defining inventions, whether it's the wheel, the light bulb, the automobile, the aeroplane, and now, of course, in the era of smartphones and social media, they have one thing in common. They have fundamentally changed the way we live our lives. So this discovery about fusion ignition goes beyond just producing cheap electricity. It could, for example, have a huge bearing on future wars. Right now, Russia is pummeling Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Today, this is a trump card that Russia has in its hands. But imagine a situation where Ukraine were producing a hundred times, or maybe even a thousand times more energy than it is doing right now. It will take away this chip from Russian hands. Energy blackmail will be a thing of the past. Imagine what this could do to the world's dependence on fossil fuels, the enormous clout that oil-producing countries in OPEC, for example, have. And all of this primarily because of what's called petrodollars. If all mobility were to be electric-driven, nuclear fusion-driven, because the cost of generating power from fusion were to become so infinitesimally small, compared to conventional fossil fuels, that would change the entire geopolitical equation, not just in the Middle East, not just in the oil-producing countries, but far beyond that. Now, when it comes to era-defining inventions, nothing is more defining than the steam engine. This new source of power was able to generate far more energy than human or animal power ever could. It dramatically changed the travel economy. Nothing had come this close where you could travel for hundreds of miles in just a matter of hours. The steam engine was discovered in 1712 by Thomas Savory. This was initially in a bid to try and draw out excess water out of mines in England. In just the last 300 years alone, humankind has seen more inventions than we have seen in the previous 3,000 years. And all of this has led to a manifold jump in the quality of human life. For example, at the time of the discovery of the steam engine back in the 17th, 18th century, the average person lived in poverty and half of the children who were born died before reaching adulthood. Today, most children live to become adults. In fact, they end up becoming healthier, better fed, more lavishly entertained and more comfortable than what even a medieval king enjoyed. Now, obviously, this journey from poverty to abundance was also fueled by many, many technological breakthroughs. Whether it was drug development, fiber optic lines, water treatment plants, one thing that all of these inventions have in common is that this was possible only because a new source of energy was discovered at that time. So here we are with the possibility of a new source of energy in nuclear fusion. As Andrew McAfee points out in his book, More From Less, from 1800 to 1970, America's gross domestic product, or GDP, and its energy consumption were almost identical to each other. They eventually decoupled in the 1970s, in part because of the cost of burning hydrocarbons 
And that is now forcing us to look for ways to economize, not just because of the limited quantity of hydrocarbons av available, but also because of the impact on the environment. But think about this for a second. What if we did not have to depend on fossil fuels? Imagine the possibilities. We could solve all the world's water problems with low-cost desalinization. We could scrub out carbon from the air and put an end to climate change. You could get rid of poverty and malnutrition across the entire developing world, bringing the entire world to an advanced standard of living. The possibilities are endless, but this is just the beginning.